This week on Healthy Living, we highlight PTSD and how people suffer from it. We will look at how WHO is assisting Malawi fight a cholera outbreak. That's in this edition of Healthy Living. Hello and welcome to Healthy Living. I'm Kamiti Kibayasi. An estimated 3.9% of world's population has suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, in the previous year. PTSD is a mental health condition that is triggered by terrifying events such as warfare, sexual assault, natural disaster, a car accident, either experiencing or witnessing, according to Mayo Clinic. PTSD can occur in all people of any ethnicity, nationality, or culture, and at any age. PTSD sufferers are more often angry, violent, or suicidal, and less able to maintain relationships. It affects not only individuals, but their families neighborhood, and the nation as a whole. Various international agencies stated that the war in Ethiopia's northern Tigray region will have a heavy mental toll on women and children, especially children who have faced the war and internal displacement need psychological help to tackle post-traumatic syndrome. VOA's Horn of Africa Stringer Mulugeta Asebeha has reported on the situation in Tigray's internally displaced children and parents. This kindergarten in northern Ethiopia's Mekele Tigray city has been serving as a shelter for internally displaced people of war since 2020. The campus serves as a shelter for 8,600 people. 5,100 of those are under the age of 18 and separated from their parents and families. Fitzum Tsega says she teaches 65 children in her class. Initially, when we give the children worksheets to write letters, they used to paint guns. They also used to get scared when they hear airplanes flying. But now we're telling them that there is peace and they're easy now. Tsega says the war has clearly psychologically traumatized the children. I want this thing to get more attention. There are children that lost their families. Now that there is peace, the children must go to their neighborhood and back to school. This thing requires attention. Meresu Gerbru is displaced from a place called Miakadra along with her daughter. Her husband and four of her children migrated to Sudan. Gebru says the war has created mental toll on children. She emphasizes the importance of psychological support and opening of schools. We need to send our children to school. School and education will calm them. Our children need playgrounds too. They need to forget the past and ease up. I think in that way they can relax. Gebre Geziabeher Hadush lives in Mekele. He says due to COVID and the war, his children have been away from school for the past four years. He says this has had a tremendous impact on the children. The war has impacted the children psychologically. So if school starts soon, it will be a great idea. However, before jumping to the textbooks, the kids need causes that can treat the post-trauma. Etzeringel Hadera is a psychiatrist in Mekele Haida Hospital. He says this war will have serious implications for future generations. Parents need to instill hope in their children. We must tell them that this shall pass. When we talk about the war, we might not notice it, but they are listening and they are recording everything in their mind. So I say, let's not talk in front of them. Let's show empathy. My second recommendation is for the media. The media must be responsible in their presentation of the war. According to a United Nations 2020 report, 
A total of 1.39 million children in the Tigray region are missing out on education because of Ethiopia's civil war. Now that the war has ended, there is an equal need for mental health support along with aid. Pauline Kamoti, a consulting clinical psychologist for children in Kenya, explains more on how to tell if children have PTSD and what treatments are available. There are several things that can tell you you have PTSD. When a person has um, loses capacity to enjoy life, like lacking in um, what do you say positive emotions, I would say, being very irritable having angry outbursts uh, and they can't explain. And these outbursts are usually very magnified compared to the situation that has triggered that outburst. Um, or uh, have a lot of worry. And then uh, in children, you see other things. For example, apart from worry, you see regression. And they'll start either bedwetting or they start losing things in school. They may also have physical symptoms. Children will have physical symptoms, like so psychosomatic symptoms. Usually when the doctor checks, there is nothing you can say is physically wrong with the child. You see these symptoms because there are triggers around. Something triggers that memory, so the person is relieving that. The other major symptoms that you see in PTSD, especially in children, is a depersonalization and realization. Now, uh, in realization, more or less, the, the, they, they space out. And in that way, the, the body, uh, for coping purposes, detaches from reality. The treatment of uh, PTSD, one of the important things is starting with a, a thorough assessment. A good assessment of PTSD is very important. And this is because sometimes PTSD, especially in children, is usually confused with uh, ADHD. And sometimes it can also be confused with anxiety and depression. The most effective way of treating PTSD in children is going multidisciplinary, meaning uh, working with different people, working with the family, the child, the family, and other involved people like the school and the teachers, so that they're psychoeducated in understanding trauma and how the child responds to trauma, so that you're able to help the child in a, in a very, say, you'd say, a comprehensive way. If the child is still being exposed to trauma, in that case, it is very difficult to treat that child. So it is important to ensure that that child is actually safe. After ensuring that, the next thing is to help the child develop uh, skills of coping with the emotions that come from the response to triggers of uh, the, 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 the trauma. The children still in Ukraine are being forced to deal with the trauma of war. To help them process their emotions, Ukrainian psychologists are using a method called toy therapy. Anna Kotsushenko reports. Nine-year-old Irina is playing calmly with her cousins at home in the village of Krasilivka outside Kyiv. But just a few months ago, she shuddered at the slightest noise says her mother Natalia Ladan. In March, early in the war, the family lived under near constant Russian shelling. We were in the cellar. There was a loud explosion. The children started screaming and crying inconsolably. The lights went out. It was terrifying. When a Russian rocket badly damaged the roof of the house, Laden left for Western Ukraine with her two daughters, sister and two nieces. They returned in April after the Russians retreated. But Laden noticed her daughters were still under a lot of stress. The family decided to visit a special toy therapy room set up by Ukrainian psychologists to help children deal with their trauma. The toy therapy room project is a special space where a child and even an adult can receive healing and have the opportunity to relieve tension, receive psychological therapy. When Irina visited the room, she picked a zebra out of the many toys available. 
Psychologists say she transferred all her fears to the toy and became terrified of the toy itself. When I went to bed with her, I had a terrible dream. I asked my grandmother to take her somewhere so that I would not see it. I felt much better. Say goodbye. <laughs> Local psychologist Vita Moskalenko says the girl transferred her fears to the toy. Now she can choose a new toy friend. What would you like? See what we have. After some hesitation, Irina chose a snake as a symbol of her own strength. Is this the right one? It's for me. Are you sure? I'm sure. The first toy therapy room opened in June. Now there are about 100 such rooms throughout Ukraine that have helped more than 1,600 Ukrainian children. Anna Kostichenko for VOA News, Kyiv region, Ukraine. The first cholera death in South Africa was confirmed as more cases are detected according to the National Health Department. The development comes on the heels of rising cases of cholera in Southern Africa, with Malawi battling its deadliest outbreak to date, with over 1,300 deaths. I talked to Dr. Nema Rusibamayila Kimambo, WHO representative in Malawi, who explained what WHO is doing to make sure cholera ends in Malawi. WHO so far has been able to, um, from its uh, internal resources, to, to provide $4.2 um, million dollars, um, for, the, for the response and also 1.4 million from the African Public Health Emergency Fund, which we oversee on behalf of the ministry. But other partners are also mobilizing resources. And first, um, WHO ensured that um, there was significant um, deployment, um, both internationally and nationally, to help to address the response. Uh, one of the problems was that most of the cholera treatment centers did not have adequate staff. So working with the government, we agreed that the government um, um, recruit such staff and we would support um, payment of the such staff. We supported recruitment of about 400, over 440 um, staff. And these ones are being placed in the five districts that are giving us um, most of the cases. So we said that at least um, within these districts, giving us the highest numbers that we would aim to have five to 10 um, uh, cholera treatment centers that um, are actually up to standard. Um, with uh, emergency medical teams, we were able to bring in two medi emergency medical teams, um, one UK Med, which was funded by FCDO, and one from Save the Children. Uh, in addition to this, um, the other thing is, is to ensure that we're able to intervene early at the community level, that people have access to rehydration. We have been able to set up about 47 oral rehydration points and our target is to set up about 150 in the high burden districts. The, um, His Excellency, the President of Malawi, launched a campaign to end cholera, which they called Tetse Cholera Campaign. And the key um, foundation of this is the community engagement. So it's about engaging um, influential people at community level, the chiefs, the, the religious leaders, engaging the, the, the local um, leaders, and then at community level to have um, community health workers who actually go down to the household level and ensure that they do active case finding um, they do health education. It's not about a temporary thing. It's about ensuring that we get this outbreak, um, bring it to an end. That's our show for today. For more health news, wellness tips, and medical breakthroughs, stay connected to Voice of America at voeafrica.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Mkamiti VOA. Until next time, Stay well and strive to make every day a healthy day.